Hello and welcome to What's the Story Ghost? I'm your host, Annette. And I'm Stephen. Today we are on episode 76. Pick up sticks. There is a bingo problem with that, is there? Is that it? Yes. But that could be anything six. That could be 26, that could be 36. 26 would be pick up two sticks. 36 would be three sticks, etc, etc. 76 would be pick up seven sticks. Is that the scout version? Are you building the fire? Is that what's... Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah let's go with that, yeah. We crack on? Crack on. I have wanted to cover the gem of a curse that is James Dean's little bastard for weeks. But then my husband up and went and bought himself a new car. So, of course, I had to wait for his mum to bless the car before I could even start writing this episode. We, Stephen and I, are not religious, but it's always been a bit of a tradition for my mother-in-law to bless our cars, even Stephen's bike. Again, I'm not religious, but I'm not going to go drive in a new car without my mother-in-law's blessing. Who in their right mind would want to push the buttons of the cosmos like that? Every family has their little traditions. Some like to gift the first full tank of fuel, and most buy little trinkets that hang from the rear view mirror or clip onto the sun visor, just as a little reminder that you, aka the driver, who might be going a little heavy footed on the accelerator, have a family who loves you. So stop being a dumbass, you're not a character on GTA, and there is no restart on the game that is life. These are just subtle reminders, assuming you even see them. But unlike the lucky trinkets your family put in your car in the hope that it'll hypnotise you not to drive like a lunatic, Alec Guinness warned James Dean about his car one week before the deadly crash. It was a bit of an accident, really, their meeting that day. According to the article in The Hollywood Reporter, Guinness and a friend were turned away from a packed restaurant in Hollywood, so they began to head elsewhere. He is quoted to have said... Then I heard feet running down the street and it was James Dean. Guinness began. He said, I was in the restaurant and you couldn't get a table. My name is James Dean. Would you please come and join me? Guinness had a number of film credits to his name and an Oscar nomination for the Lavender Hill mob. So Dean knew he was a big deal. Guinness and his friend agreed and started walking back towards the restaurant. But before they went inside, Dean wanted to show off his new car, Guinness recalled. There in the courtyard of this little restaurant was this little silver thing, very smart, all done up in cellophane, with a bunch of roses tied to its bonnet. Guinness told Parkinson, adding that he asked how fast it could go. Dean replied, it would do 150 mile per hour. I said, have you driven it? And he said, no, I have never been in it at all. Guinness said. And some strange thing came over me, some almost different voice, and I said, look, I won't join your table unless you want me to. But I must say something, please do not get into that car, because if you do, and I looked at my watch and I said, if you get into that car at all, it's now Thursday, Friday actually, 10 o'clock at night, and by 10 o'clock at night next Thursday, you will be dead if you get into that car. Dean brushed the warning off and the group proceeded to have a charming dinner, Guinness told Parkinson. And he was dead the following Thursday afternoon in that car, said Guinness, who died in 2000. It was one of those odd things. It was a very, very odd, spooky experience. I liked him very much too. I would have loved to have known him more. Maybe it's just me, but if Obi-Wan Kenobi tells me not to do something, I would think I'd be inclined to believe him. But that isn't even the strangest thing that happened regarding this car. It's after the accident that things got either very weird or just a series of very unfortunate coincidences. But let's get to know the man behind the curse because James Dean died so young some of our listeners may not know who he is. James Byron Dean was born the 8th of February 1931 in Marion, Indiana. An only child born to his father Winton, a humble farmer, and his mother Mildred. When James was six years old, the family moved to the considerably different city of sunny Santa Monica, California. But sadly, little Dean wouldn't enjoy those sunny skies for very long. At the tender age of nine, Dean's mother, Mildred, passed away from cancer, but he never really understood his mother's passing, according to his autobiography. He was promptly sent back to Indiana to be raised by his uncle Marcus and aunt Hortensa on the devoted Quaker couple's farm. This in itself sounds like the beginning of a movie. Young boy loses his mother and is sent away to live with his cold relatives, but that's not what happened at all. 
Marcus was a keen sportsman and did nothing but encourage his nephew's naturally competitive spirit. Dean had always enjoyed the violin, playing in concerts and tap dancing on theatre stages, but most of all he loved art, the gift of moulding something with his hands. By the time Dean started high school, he excelled in baseball, basketball, track and field, drama and public speaking. And then for his 16th birthday, Uncle Marcus surprised Dean with a gift. Something you just wouldn't expect from a Midwestern Quaker farmer. It was a Czechoslovakian 125cc motorcycle and James Dean loved it. He painted the bike in his school's colours and to no one's surprise, James became even more popular at school. I mean, come on, he was 16 and it was the mid-1940s. He started hanging out in the local motorcycle shop and it wasn't long before he was seen speeding around town and racing friends. Dean's newly found need for speed was soon followed with enthusiasm for sports car racing. Unfortunately, the motorcycle ignited a passion that sealed his faith. Fast forward a few years and James Dean returned to California where he attended Santa Monica Junior College and UCLA. He began acting with James Whitmore's acting workshop, appeared in occasional television commercials and played several roles in films and on stage. But in the winter of 1951, he took Whitmore's advice and moved to New York to pursue a serious acting career. After appearing in seven television shows and working as a busboy in the theatre district to get by, he won a small part in a Broadway play called See the Jaguar. If it seems like his career was only just beginning, that's because it was. Within a short amount of time and a lot of hard work, he became an actor, known for his work in silver screen classics such as Rebel Without a Cause and East of Eden from the golden age of Hollywood cinema. He was killed on September 30th, 1955, when he collided with another vehicle in his silver Porsche 550 Spider. Dean had just finished filming Giant, during which Warner Brothers Studios had forbidden him from racing, so he was eager to get back out on the road. He was braking in the new car, which he nicknamed Little Bastard, on the way to the races in Salinas, California. Ralph Woodrick, a Porsche mechanic who was helping Dean prepare the car for the weekend sports car races, was in the passenger seat. Dean's friend Bill Hickman, a stunt driver for Warner Brothers, and photographer Sanford H. Roth were following far behind in Dean's Ford station wagon. To absolutely no one's surprise, the speed freak Dean was pulled over and ticketed near Bakersfield for going 65 mile an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. Not exactly breakneck speed, which is probably why that didn't deter him from testing the spider's limits when they started off again. Dean left Hickman and the station wagon in his rearview mirror as they headed down Route 466, now Route 46, for Paso Robles, where they planned to meet for dinner that evening. As Dean approached the junction of Route 46 and Route 41, a 23-year-old college student named Donald Turnipseed was turning into the intersection. He never even saw the low-profile spider, and it's thought that Dean was going too fast to stop. Dean tried to swerve, but a collision was unavoidable and he collided almost head-on with Turnipseed's 1954 Tudor. The impact sent Turnipseed's heavy Ford sliding 39 feet down the highway, but the spider, a much lighter car, was propelled into the air. A witness reported it doing cartwheels and smashing into the ground several times. Little Bastard was little more than a crumpled pile of aluminium and steel. Wooterick was thrown from the wreck and survived, but Dean was not so lucky. He was trapped in the car, his foot crushed between the clutch and the brake pedal. His neck and arms were broken, his jaw fractured and had massive internal and external injuries. Passers-by stopped to help, one of whom was a woman with nursing experience. She checked Dean for a pulse and found it, but it was very weak. The exact details of Dean's death vary. The nurse said Dean's death appeared to have been instantaneous, but Hickman reached the scene about 10 minutes after the collision and pried Dean from the wreck. Author Warren Beat wrote in his book, The Death of James Dean, that Dean died in Hickman's arms. Wuthrick and Turnipseed both survived the crash. Dean was pronounced dead an hour when he finally arrived at the hospital an hour later. His funeral was held in his hometown of Fairmont, Indiana. It was a closed casket to conceal his severe injuries. 
Car designer George Barris is said to have purchased the remains of Little Bastard for $2,500. Barris is the source of several of the curses, so I would be inclined to take it all with a pinch of salt. When tales of a curse all come from one source, they control the narrative, but some of the stories can be verified. Barris has been quoted saying everything that car has touched has turned to tragedy. As per CometOverHollywood.com, some of the curse stories include the following. After the total Porsche was purchased, Barris said the vehicle slipped off the trailer and broke a mechanic's leg. Barris said he sold parts from the Porsche to Beverly Hills doctor Troy McHenry and Burbank doctor William Eskrid. The two men were racing against one another in separate vehicles that both had parts from the Porsche 550. McHenry lost control of the car, hit a tree and was killed. Estrick, who was driving with Dean's engine, was also injured in a wreck during the race. This story seems to be true based on an October 24, 1956 article in the Spokane Daily Chronicle. After the accident, Eskrid is quoted as saying he's not superstitious about using Dean's engine and parts. Barris had two tyres from the 550 and sold them. The tyres apparently both blew out simultaneously, causing the new tyre owner's car to run off the road. Barris kept the Porsche and two people tried to steal parts. Barris said one of the suspect's arms was torn open trying to steal the steering wheel and the other was injured, trying to remove the blood-stained tartan seat. In 1959, the little bastard was put on display by the California Highway Patrol for a safety exhibit. Supposedly, the petrol garage that housed the Porsche caught on fire, according to the death of James Dean by a Warren Newton Beath. Again, supposedly, the Porsche Spider was being transported when the driver of the truck lost control. The driver apparently fell out of the truck and was crushed by the Porsche when it fell off the back. The car also fell off other vehicles during their transports. Then in 1960, the 1955 Porsche Spider disappeared into thin air after an exhibit in Miami, according to Barris in his 1974 book, Cars of the Stars. While the various curses are interesting, I am inclined to think many of them are made up stories. The only ones that are true and have credible documentation are the deaths and injuries of McHenry and Eskrid. However, the mystery and myths that still revolve around James Dean, even today, show his effect on pop culture and influence on film history. What did you think of that story? That was an interesting story. It was, wasn't it? Mm. Do you want to see some pictures? Oh, yeah. I've never actually seen the car before I started to do the research. Now, I've always been interested in the story, but I never realised how bad it was damaged. Um, I know I touched off it very briefly there, but they did actually use the car as an example oh also i wanted to show you how big a ford tudor was oh it's a big old it's a big it's a fridge on wheels basically the size of it in comparison to this this is tiny and i don't know i'm not speaking ill of the dead but i think anyone who's mad unless they're formula one i think anyone driving a convertible as a race car is just bonkers you need that extra safety Mm. but that that's where we've come i suppose in years but i never realized how bad the wreck was Um, I don't think the other chap had his seatbelt on. I'm pretty sure that's the only reason he survived. That's it there. Have you ever had to fill out an accident report for your insurance company? Yeah. Where you have like a little picture of the most geriatric looking car. Yeah. The most generic looking car, not geriatric looking car. And you have to like circle the wing mirror or, you know, the side that got a ding or whatever. Um... It was kind of like a little report like that, but it actually put into perspective. So basically the highway that they were on didn't have, you know, the way we have flyovers. Yeah. So you take the slip road up or down and you go under or over the motorway. Mm -hmm. They didn't have them on this particular motorway. So what he did was the chap in the Ford turned left onto James Dean's side of the road. Now, I wasn't belittling the issue with the speed there it's just the the cops on scene actually said that it wouldn't i don't think speed was a massive factor i think the poor chap just he was driving a really low down car yeah he couldn't and see there's it. no way your man would have he seen might it. have been there might have been a sun behind him on a long stretch headlights on and you might mm. drive with your headlights on in the daytime kids it should just be automatic just turn them on it's, it's not on. costing anything extra to 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 leave them on or not um but what do you think about all the stuff that happened afterwards yeah like the history of the car is amazing it's and very, it's 
but it's it's all the stuff afterwards that I'm like, is it coincidental or? But then all the stories are coming from the same guy. It had a um, excuse the pun, but it had a ring to one of our older stories. Mm. Uh, you remember the Rudolph Rudolph Valentino? Yeah. And he had a cursed ring, and then he passed it off after and he every, died. Yeah. And everybody that touched the died. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there was the metal was melted down and put into a car park somewhere. Well, I mean, there's 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 other stories that I've heard about this, and that's kind of what drew me to it in the first place. Because there, that's the little um, I'll stick up the. It's on cult of weird dot com, um, and it's basically just a little illustration of what happened. So this is James Dean's car. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that right? Yeah, James Dean. This is James Dean's car. Yeah. yeah, and then your man turned right straight over onto this side of the road. So I don't know if there was a car in front of him or if it was just a it was just a really bad accident. And I mean, those these things these things happen. But unfortunately, it's it's the difference between somebody driving something the size of a fridge in comparison to something yeah. the size of a small microwave. Like the car he was driving, the Ford. It was a pretty big car. Small car, big truck cardboard box <laughs> um, but yeah all the stuff that happened afterwards was really freaky I just find when something comes from one source and it's like more extravagant more elaborate stories I think that maybe possibly as it was coming to the end of those type of sports cars the eras were changing and everybody was getting more into you know big box body cars like Mustangs and you know just much bigger muscle cars when they were going away from the way of those small tiny little sports cars i think he was just trying to stay relevant maybe mm. and all that kind of stuff now nobody knows where the car is now that fascinates me how do you lose a big chunk of metal and um, he said he was traveling home from one of his shows it was one of the um safety shows uh, which i think is brilliant because nothing will get kids to slow down more than an absolute shock factor yeah. Um, but he was driving home from one of those events and closed up the back doors himself or watched it be- being closed. The car was there, drove to wherever it was he was driving. Now, you know, as much as I do in America, you could here to Galway is nothing to them. Yeah. Um, so he was driving some distance, got home, opened up the boot, got up the boot, opened up the back of the trailer and the car was gone. That's mad. That, that's a bit spooky. Oh, it's like Lightning McQueen when he fell out of the back of the truck. <laughs> He's in Little Bastard is in some little small town, town type, yeah. off Route 66 repaving roads and making Earth friends Keep. and girlfriends yeah <laughs> um, yeah no I, I, I opened up a, a, you can see it there there's probably like 27 tabs open at the moment so I, I didn't actually fall down a rabbit hole this was a bit of a rabbit hole because I was only really trying to focus on the stories that sounded you know like they had some sort of backing behind them did you perchance manage to come up with any characters for me do you know I didn't because James Dean is James, James Dean James Dean is James Dean yeah. or you know uh, your man Rudolph Valentino played a part of James it's just weird stuff I, I want to say Michael Kelso but what's his real name Miley Cyrus Ashley Kutcher a young John Travolta I'm sick with Ashley Kutcher yeah I just realised this, my... this is your part of the game it's yeah. not my part I lost the game alright <laughs> we just we just so, really annoyed look, half of our listeners we'll have, we'll have a we'll have a screen test with Ashley Kutcher and another screen test with John Travolta but it would have to be a young Aston now, Kutcher and a young John Travolta yeah so. yeah well I haven't said that now that you mentioned John Travolta he would probably have been driving the Ford yeah Tudor. because yeah, it, I, the... that's very like what he rebuilt in one of his previous documentaries Grease, <laughs> Grease Lightning where it, where it follows the real life intrepids of youthful teenagers of that generation who rebuild a motor engine and race it down an aqueduct for the title of best teenager of that era. Please don't be mad at me. I thought the one with Michelle Pfeiffer was the first Grease. I don't know if that just shows you the talk, era you that talk, I grew up in. I didn't grow up with the did, original Did you Grease. think Grease 2 was, was Grease, Grease 1? 1, yeah. Yeah, no, you're mistaken. No, uh, <laughs> Olivia Newton-John was in Grease 1. I know who it is now, but when I was growing up, I just thought, I think it was actually one of my neighbours, Laura or something, who put me onto it. And she was like, how have you never seen this movie? And in my head now, I'm like, oh my God, how had you never seen that movie by that age? Because my mum was really into all of that stuff. Yeah. Like, my mum grew up around bikes and then obviously it was my, my dad's bike that, caught my mum's eye she had he had left his bike light on and they were both in the chipper or he was talking to a friend or something 
and she went over to him he was standing in the shipper sorry and she said sorry you're after leaving your motorbike uh, headlight on and he was like oh no no thanks so much thanks so much and then out of nowhere here I am ta-da twinkle in your dad's motorcycle bike but uh, yeah for, for my mom not to although then again my mum raised us on Mary Poppins and chitty chitty bang bang yeah my, my auntie who babysat me used to come up and she'd just like right we're taking on Greece Greece really? some sweets yeah oh you were so much more cultured than me <laughs> we finish up there sorry just to answer that question yes and yes finish up there <laughs> say your words yeah So thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I will, of course, include links in the show notes. If you have any questions on this or any other episode, our socials are What's the Story Ghost on Instagram and What's the Story Ghost at gmail.com if you have any personal stories you would like to share. And those are all my words. Exit jingle. Exit jingle. Bye. Bye. You went up. You went like an extra little tiny bit in more than I was. But, and then I thought we were going to break into the lyrics, and then I was like, "Shut up, Annette! This is not your part of the show either." I knew the tune to that one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. You did good.